Well, good evening to your Victory Through Faith Church family and friends. Of course, this is Pastor Jay getting ready to teach the midweek message. I pray that everything is going well with you. I declare that you are the head and not the tail. I declare that you are above only and not beneath. This is the day that the Lord has made. And we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Even though there's a threat of inclement weather, we speak over the weather. We declare that the angels of the Lord are encamped around about us to keep and protect us from all hurt, harm, and danger seen and unseen. We declare that over our friends, over our relatives, over our loved ones in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I've got a continuation of a word we started last week that I want to share with you. We're going to dive a little deeper into it. And I believe you're going to be blessed by it. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's talk to God. Let's get him involved in what we're doing. And then we'll launch out and get into the word. Father God, we thank you for another opportunity to come boldly before your throne of grace. We thank you for your wisdom and we thank you for revelation knowledge as we commune around your word. I pray that every person that comes into contact with this teaching will receive at least one revelatory word from you that they can apply to their lives and experience a divine change. Holy Spirit, help me to teach the word with accuracy and with simplicity so that the power within your children, Lord God, can be awakened and activated. And I give you the glory in advance right now in Jesus name. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, let's get into the word. I, I'm going to try to keep you around 30 minutes or so. I endeavor to be shorter during the midweek message because I know that there are a lot of things pulling for your attention. And I just know that, you know, as far as keeping your attention, you know, Sundays, I'm going to give you about 50 minutes or so. However, during the midweek message, I want to give you less time because I want you to be able to spend that time around the amount of time you would spend with a sitcom. I want you to be able to spend that time around the word to just nourish yourself and to keep you fed and keep you going. So as I alluded to earlier, we are continuing with something that the spirit of God laid on my heart last week that I believe is a blessing and will continue to be a blessing for you. We started a lesson last week entitled Dead and Alive, The Duality of Our Reality. Dead, not dead or alive, dead and alive. The duality of our reality. And this is lesson two. Again, we started last week, and so I'm going to give you just a little bit of review. We're going to read from our scripture text in Romans chapter six, verses one through 11. I'll do that shortly, but before I do, or however, before I do, I want to share a few statements with you before we launch out into it, because today I'm going to primarily expound on the first four verses of Romans chapter six. Now I'm going to read verses one through 11 in its entirety. And then I'm going to come back and expound or share with you some things that the spirit of God shared with me out of those first four verses. And then we'll go as follows with the rest of the verses next week. So last week, or just to bring you up to speed, last week we learned that born again, children of God are the only species on earth that exist as both dead and alive at the same time. We exist as both dead and alive at the very same time. We are the only species on earth. We are the only created beings that can do that. We exist as both dead and alive at the same time. We also learned that it's important that we learn to navigate the duality of our reality. We have to learn to navigate the duality of our reality. In other words, we have to stop drifting with the wind and the tide, and we have to start actively steering the ship of our lives. We have to embrace and navigate the duality or the contrasting elements, the contrasting aspects of death and life. We have to navigate the reality of that duality or that dichotomy and to do so, we have to choose to stop drifting with the wind, stop drifting with the tide, stop allowing life to happen to us and to start actively steering the ship of our born again lives. Glory to God. We must embrace 
the duality of our reality. And we have to start navigating that duality, navigating the reality of that duality, understanding what it means, and then making decisions based on the revelation of our reality. We are both dead and alive at the very same time. So what does that mean? That means that every day we must choose to die and to live every single day. As born again children of God, we must choose to both die and live. That means we've got to die to some things and we've got to come alive to some things. That means some things have to be put under the old I'm done with category and some things have to be put in the new I'm progressing in this area category. Understanding that navigating the duality of our reality doesn't mean you're going to have it all together. Okay, let me make that plain first and foremost. This does not mean that you're going to be the perfect Christian tomorrow because that's not that's not attainable. We can seek to be perfected, but we'll never be perfect. But we do need to navigate the reality or the duality of our reality, understanding that at any given moment, I am both dead and alive. And understanding that will help us when it when it becomes time to make a choice between Okay, will I react or will I respond? Will I say what my flesh wants to say or will I say what the word tells me to say? Will I heed to my old nature or will I heed to what the Holy Spirit is telling me? We have to navigate the reality or the duality of our reality because there are always two forces working in us. Wow, that's good. There are always two forces working in us. That old man wants his shine. (laughs) That old man wants to do what he wants to do. And we have to navigate that reality by recognizing that because I still want to do some things that I know God tells us not to do doesn't mean I'm some backslidden, low down, worth good for nothing sinner. That just means I understand that as a born again child of God, there's a reality to my duality. There's a duality that's my reality that I have to navigate. I am dead and alive at the same time. And every day I've got to choose to die and to live. I want to read a text real quick before we get into our lesson text in Romans chapter six. The Bible says in Galatians chapter two, let me get there. Galatians chapter two, I'm reading from the King James version of the Bible. Verse 20, Paul is writing to the church at Galatia. This is one of the things he tells them. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, now we understand the crucifixion refers to death. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Glory to God. And the life which I now live in the flesh, that lower nature, that unredeemed part of us, I live by the faith or I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Paul is letting the the Galatian church know, hey, I'm crucified with Christ. I died with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. So I'm dead, but I'm alive. I died, but I'm living. He says, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live that by faith in the son of God because he loved me and he gave himself for me. That's one of the greatest revelations you can gain as a child of God, that there's a duality to your reality. You are dead and alive at the very same time. Now, what will be the dominant portion of you or what will become the dominant part of you will be what you feed the most. If you feed that old dead man, he's going to dominate your thinking. He's going to dominate your existence. But if you feed that new you, that new you where old things passed away and behold, all things have become new, then that new you will take the ascendancy and that new you will begin to dominate until your old man, that old flesh, that old nature. No, that's not how we do things anymore. We crucify that with Christ. The life we now live, we live by faith in the son of God. Every day we must choose to die and to live. I'm crucified with Christ and I'm living for Christ. Glory to God. Now let's go back to Romans chapter six. I'm going to read verses one through 11 again, because as I alluded to, that's our scripture text. That's our proof text. And then I'm going to come back to you and I'm going to read from the first, or I'm going to expound from the first 
four verses of the text, what the spirit of God has illuminated and showed to me that he wants me to share with you. Amen. So let's King James Version. I'm there all night, all evening, starting at verse one of Romans chapter six. I'm going to read verses one through verses 11 or verse 11. It says, what shall we say then? Now, what shall we say then is really, let me read that again. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now that is actually a response to what Paul was writing about in chapter five, looking at verse 20. He says, moreover, we got to understand it. Let me take out a moment real quick. We got to understand that the Bible was not originally in chapter and verse, okay? The Holy Scripture was not originally in chapter and verse. That was added when the translators, uh, call, when the translators put together the Holy Bible so we could go to particular places and understand what we were reading. So initially, it was not chapter and verse. So often picking up at a new chapter by itself you miss out on what God is saying because there was some information connected in the prior chapter or previous chapter that directly relates to the chapter you're reading. Now, for instance, when we pick up at chapter six, verse one, it says, what shall we say then? Well, that's a question. Well, you don't start us. You don't start out with a question. That means that it's referring to something that happened previously. And you could all, you could really go all the way back to chapter four if you wanted to. But for the sake of what we're talking about, when it says, what shall we say then? It's referring to what is expounded on in verse 20 of chapter 5. It says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto life by Jesus, unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Then we pick up in chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We're going to talk about that in a moment. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, I love this, you got to catch this, knowing this, that our old man is crucified. That's what Paul was talking about in Galatians 2.20. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Him is a reference to Christ. That the body of sin might be destroyed or rendered inoperative. We know it's not totally destroyed because there's still a pull to sin. There's still a desire for us to sin. So we know it's not completely destroyed. So that word destroyed is better or it's a better it's a more accurate term to say has been rendered inoperative, or I like to say nullified. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, referring to Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed, might be nullified, might be rendered inoperative, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death has no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, one time for everybody. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. And it's implied that he lives unto God forever. Verse 11 is our stop verse, our stop point. Likewise, reckon or consider you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Notice we are dead and alive. We are to reckon or consider ourselves to be dead indeed to something and then alive to something. So we are to consider or reckon ourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God. And we're dead unto sin and alive. Oh, that's good, Lord. We're dead unto sin and we are alive unto God through the same way. 
Jesus Christ our Lord. We are dead to sin and alive unto God through the same method, Jesus Christ, salvation. Amen. So that's why we are both dead and alive at the same time. Verse 11 shows us the duality of our reality. It says, reckon yourself, consider yourself. We talked about last week, you're responsible for this. You have to reckon yourself. You have to consider yourself dead to sin. I will not let sin have dominion over me. Verse 14 says, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but you are under grace. So because you are under grace, sin should not dominate you. Sin should have no dominion, no power, no authority over you because it's our responsibility to reckon ourselves, to consider ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I told you that I was going to read or expound on the first four verses of Romans chapter six. So that's exactly what I'm going to do right now. The first thing I want to point out to you in verse one, let's read that again. Glory to God. I love this. There's a, there's a, there's a anointing in here. That's just really, it's really thorough. It's really powerful. Praise God. Have your way, Lord God. Verse one of Romans six, King James, I'll read it again, says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Since we got so much grace, the more we sin, the greater his grace is. That's what that's what was being implied. And Paul was like, no, 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 that, that's not what we're doing. That's not what we're doing. We don't continue in sin so more and more grace can flow. But what this does point out to me and what I did want to show is that in verse one, it says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound, which means, and we all know this to be so, which means it's possible to receive salvation and yet continue in sin. I know that just, oh, what Pastor Jay? That can't be. Oh yes. I think we all know that on a personal level. It is possible to receive salvation, to be a born again, spirit filled child of God and still continue in sin. It's possible. Not only is it possible, it's happening on a daily basis. It is possible and it happens more often than we would like for it to happen that we are born again, spirit filled children of God, yet we still continue in sin. Or if that wasn't the case, Paul would never have asked. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, to say continue in sin implies that he's not right to unsaved people. Romans is a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Rome, the, the church at Rome. OK, so we are dealing with Christians. We are dealing with children of God that are struggling with the old versus the new. And Paul's letting them know, hey, we don't continue in sin. So more and more grace can abound. And in the same way, believers should not continue in things they were bound to before they gave their life to Jesus Christ. And going even further, believers should not allow themselves to be bound or tethered to things that don't promote a kingdom agenda. Wow, that's good. Now, I know that takes some work. I know that takes some work and primarily it starts with good teaching, with good doctrine, with knowing what God wants from us, knowing what God has done for us, understanding what God expects of us, and then trusting the grace of God and the spirit of God who dwells on the inside of every child of God to help us reach that goal, to help us to reach unto the attainment for the prize of the high calling of God and Christ. So we learn from verse one that it is possible to receive salvation and yet continue in sin. We should not do it, but believers do it all the time. We all have our moments. We all have our issues where we kind of fall back into old behavior patterns and we do things that are connected to our old nature that don't glorify God. Well, there's grace for that. John 1, 9, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is for a child of God. That's not for the world. You have to be first a child of God 
in order to receive the cleansing from all unrighteousness after you've become a child of God. So 1 John 1, 9 is not for the world. For the world, we say John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's what we declare to the world. To the church, we say, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we understand we're all on the same page. It is possible to receive salvation and yet continue to sin. We don't want to do that, but it's possible to do so. Now in verse two, Paul answers the question. Verse one says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul says in verse two, God forbid, no way, Jose. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now, that's important. You've got to consider yourself dead to sin. Paul says we are dead to sin. Now, listen to this. Because of the grace of God, and that grace of God is manifested through Jesus Christ. Everything we get from God is through Jesus, okay? Whatever good things we get from God, whatever benefits, whatever privileges we get from God is because of Jesus. Because of the grace of God manifested through Jesus Christ, every believer is dead to sin. Check it out now. In God's eyes, because of the grace of God that was manifested on us through Jesus Christ, Every believer is dead to sin in God's eyes, okay? Now, I understand we, we still wrestle and grapple with sin, but that's because we're tripping. We hadn't gotten the full revelation of who we are in, in Christ and what being in Christ means for us, the authority and the power and the privilege that carries. But in God's eyes, in God's sight, from God's perspective, we're dead to sin. He says, for my own sake, I will remember your sins no more. Glory to God. He said, hey, you and sin, I don't see y'all together. I only see you through the, through the shed blood of my son, Jesus Christ. But if we don't reckon ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin and alive unto righteousness, sin exercises dominion over us, even when in God's sight, he sees us as sinless because he sees us through the blood of Jesus Christ. So what do we need to do? We should not live in what we are dead to. What does that mean, Pastor Jay? If we're dead to sin, we shouldn't live in sin or allow that sin to, that's a good way of saying it. We should not allow sin to usurp its authority in our lives when we've been given authority over it. I know there are times when we feel like we just can't get over, we can't get past, it's too strong, the pull is too great in that area, and so we feel like we're a slave to sin, but you got to understand God has freed you from the power of sin, but you've got to reckon yourself dead to it. We talked last week about how when you, you hear people in relationships say, well, they're dead to me, or they've come out of a relationship, they had a rough breakup, and they say, well, that person is dead to me. Well, we know that when they say that, that does not mean that that person has literally, physically died and left this planet. That means that as far as I'm concerned, I don't have any dealings with that person. That person is somewhere right now in this city, in this state, in this world doing their thing, but I could care less because as far as I am concerned, they're dead to me. They have no sway over my life. Their choices don't affect me. What they're doing has nothing to do with what I'm doing. Well, that's how we need to view sin. We need to say sin is dead to me. It's still out there. It's still trying to pull on me. It still wants to hook back up. It still wants to reconnect, but I'm dead to it. I'm dead to sin. And I'm alive unto righteousness. I got a new boo. <laughs> I dumped sin and I'm alive unto righteousness. And righteousness is is real good to me. So I'm not going to go back to what I went through because what I went through is pulling on me. Mm. I'm not going to go back to what I went through because what I went through is pulling on me. I'm staying with righteousness because righteousness treats me real good. Glory to God. We should not live in what we are dead to. Don't let sin exercise any dominion over you. We have to view it. How do we do it, Pastor Jay? We must view ourselves, and we're still expounding on verse 2. We must view ourselves as God does, dead to sin. I won't let that rule me. I'm dead to it. I won't let that impact me. I'm dead to it. 
I'm dead to sin. I, I I know the pool is there, but I'm not going to give into it because as far as I'm concerned, I'm dead to it. They can shout all they want. They can scream all they want. They can talk about how much they want me back. I'm not going back. Well, in the same way, it can pull all it wants to. It can hit my mind all it wants to. I'm not giving in. I'm not doing that. I'm not saying that. I'm not going there because I'm alive unto righteousness. I consider myself dead to sin. What do I mean by dead? Because we got we to gotta talk about this. Dead means when I consider myself dead to sin, I consider myself to no longer willingly submit to it. Just like we say we're dead to that person. We're not in that relationship. I'm not going to submit myself to their advances because I'm dead to them and they're dead to me. Well, in the same way, I'm not going to submit myself willingly to sin because sin is dead to me and I'm dead to it. So, to say I'm dead to sin means I no longer willingly submit and subject myself to sin, to what it wants me to do, to where it wants me to go, to how it wants me to react, to how it wants me to speak, think, talk, act. I will no longer willingly submit myself to sin. I'm dead to it. Glory to God. Verse three. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. So what does that mean? As far as verse three is concerned, in the eyes of God, when Jesus died, we died. Ooh, you got to catch this. Now, that's why that's why in his eyes, every believer is dead to sin because he's looking at Jesus. He's not looking at us. See, when we give our life to Jesus Christ, God looks on us the same way he looks on Jesus. That's why he can say, for my own sake, I'll remember your sins no more because I'm looking at my son, Jesus. I'm not looking at your faults. I'm not looking at your frailties. I'm not looking at your insecurities. I'm not looking at your missteps and your mistakes. I am looking at you. I'm looking at you through the lens of my son, Jesus Christ. So in the eyes of God, when Jesus died, we died. Glory to God. You got to say that. Say that with me. When Jesus died, I died. Glory to God. When Jesus died, the old you died. Guess what? That's good, Lord. I like that. And when Jesus died, when you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you died retroactively. What does that mean? That your death connected to his death on the cross. When he died, you died. So God covers everything you did before salvation. And because he's so good and merciful, he covers everything you do after salvation. Now, can I touch on that? Touch on it later. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I'll touch on that a little bit later, not on this lesson, but on another lesson about how even though he reckons us dead to sin, there's still a penalty and a price we pay for engaging in sin. I'm not going to get into that this evening. We'll talk about that in the next lesson or so. So let's look at verse four, because I've got several points I want to touch in verse four, and then we'll wrap it up for tonight. Therefore, we are buried with him, referring to Christ, by baptism into death, that like or just as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, you got to catch this. Therefore, we are buried with Christ by baptism into death, that like as or just like Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So what do I want to share with you here? Jesus' death for sin becomes our death to sin. Now that's important because Jesus didn't die to sin because Jesus was not sinful. Jesus was not born in sin. Jesus never committed sin. Our sins were placed on Jesus on the cross. I believe it was during those three hours of complete darkness. God placed all the sins of humanity on Christ on the cross. So Jesus did not die to sin. Jesus died for sin and his death for sin becomes our death to sin when we are born again. Amen. Because we're born in sin. We can't help it. When we are born, we're born with a sin nature. Jesus was born from the seed of God through the womb of a woman. So he was never born with a sin nature. He was born sinless and flawless. So Jesus' death for sin becomes our death to sin 
when we are born again. It says, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, we're talking about baptism. What are they referring to? I believe it's referring to the, the symbolic act of water baptism, because water baptism is symbolic of our identification with the death of Christ. Now, water baptism is not salvation. Water baptism follows after salvation, and it is symbolic of our identification with the death of Christ. So the water baptism being, that's why I believe that believers should be immersed in the water. Some sprinkle, some do other things. I'm not here for that type of debate. I believe according to the word of God and according to what the word itself means that we should be immersed in water because that, that is our identification of being buried with him, being brought under with him. So water baptism is symbolic of our identification with the death of Christ and coming up out of the water is symbolic of our identification with the resurrection life of Christ. So when you go down, you go down symbolic of that old you. And when you come up, you come up as symbolic of the new you. You share in the resurrection life of Christ. Glory to God. Old things passed away. All things become new. And that water baptism is symbolic of your identifying with Christ. His death his burial, and his resurrection. Glory to God. Now, it, we got a term here that I want to talk about before we shut this down. It says, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Now, when we see walk in the Bible, primarily in the New Testament, it's referring to live. It's synonymous with live or conduct ourselves. So you can read that by saying, even so, we also should live or conduct ourselves in newness of life. Now, this is a revelation that I got from God that I was really looking forward to sharing with you. We walk in newness of life the same way Jesus did. Well, how did Jesus do? Let's go back to the, to the text. Therefore, we are buried with him, referring to Christ, by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead. Now, how was Christ raised up from the dead? The scripture tells us that Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. So, in the same way that Jesus walked in newness of life, we walk in newness of life by the glory of the Father. Now, our asked God several, a while back, I said, Lord, what does your glory mean? Because I'm seeing glory and I'm hearing people say this and say that. I want to know what your glory means. And God was very succinct and simple when he gave it to me. He told me that glory is just a manifestation of his power and his presence. Also his protection and his provision. But for the sake of what I'm talking about right now, the glory of God is simply a manifested presence or, a manif or the manifested power of God. And when you think about that, when you see the glory showing up, even in the Old Testament, the glory cloud showed up, the pillar of fire showed up. What was that? It was a manifestation of the power and or the presence of God. So we walk in newness of life the same way Jesus did by the glory of the Father, his manifested power, his manifested presence. Now, as we prepare to shut this down, listen to me. It is God's desire. We're talking about being dead and alive, the duality of our reality. It is God's desire that we live and behave in our newness of life in Christ. Again, it is God's desire that we live and behave in our newness of life in Christ. Now, we already learned that we can do this by the glory of the Father, so we don't have to do this in our own strength. So it should be easier for us to embrace this newness of life in Christ because we don't have to do it on our own. We do it according to his glory, his manifested power and manifested presence in and on our lives. Yes, God knows our hearts, but our behavior matters. Amen. God, we always hear people say, well, God knows my heart. When we miss it, when we mess up, when we, when we make a mistake, we say, well, God knows my heart. God knows my heart. He knows how I feel. He knows what I mean. Yeah. But he also wants us to walk in newness of life. He wants us to be dead to that old stuff and alive to the newness of life in Christ. So yes, God knows our hearts, but our behavior matters. Amen. Praise God. Now, I pray that this lesson helps you to 
uh, not be slave to your behavior. Glory to God. And that's all of us. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be, well, this is just how I'm wired. That's it. I've always been this way. I've been this way for 20, 30, 40 years. I ain't changing now. Well, that's not biblical. That's not biblical. As a child of God, we should be ever changing. We should be ever going from faith to faith, glory to glory. One level of God's manifested power and presence in our life to the next level of God's manifested power and presence in our lives. We should not be who we were when we got saved. We should be growing and developing. And part of that means I embrace this newness of life in Christ. Amen. Well, that's all I got for you this evening. I, I've i got more and I've already made a couple of lessons out of where we're going. I believe you're going to be blessed by this as we continue to go deeper and deeper. But that's enough for tonight. So I want you to know this. You are empowered by faith. You are equipped for service. And don't get worried. Don't get hesitant. Don't get nervous. Your success, your ability to walk in newness of life is in God's word. I love you. I'm praying for you. And I want you to be blessed in Jesus' name.